Hi, I'm Jeff Moore, and today I want to give you a chalk talk on a new book I've written called Zone to Win, Organizing to Compete in an Age of Disruption. It's not a very long book, and I hope to interest you in digging into it deeply. The chalk talk is going to cover three things. It's going to cover the challenge that the book seeks to address, which is a challenge that Clay Christensen taught us to call the innovator's dilemma. It's how does an established enterprise stay true to its existing book of business and still catch the next wave? And what we're going to talk about is a, is a organizational framework called the four zones and how that, that organizational framework helps you both maintain your commitments to, the, to, to your established book of business and get yourself in a position to catch the next wave. And we're going to end up the, the, the chalk talk talking about two case studies, one with Salesforce and one with Microsoft, in, in, a, in a frame we call zone to win or zone offense and zone defense. And you'll see where that goes. So when you think about the impact of disruptive innovation, the key idea here is that something that used to be expensive and scarce has now become ubiquitous and free. If you look at the, at the innovations of cloud computing, smartphones, uh, social networks, uh, data science, and Internet of Things, these are five ways of disruption going through our economy right now. The reason they're getting so much attention? Well, let's look at each one. In the case of cloud computing, it makes deploying software applications globally virtually free, certainly compared to how it was 25 years ago. If you look at smartphones and you say, what does it take to connect with a, with a billion people on the planet one-to-one, -one, the answer is virtually free. They have their own phone, you don't pay for the network, it's all there. You look at social networking and you say, well, I'm not sure that isn't that more of a consumer thing, but if you look at businesses, you say, look at Uber, look at Airbnb, both of those companies are adding resources to their business networks for free. Uber does not buy cars and Uber does not you know, employ drivers and Airbnb does not buy properties and they don't employ property managers. So you can begin to see how social is going to change. Wherever it can be applied, it's going to change the rules of engagement. And then data science gives us the ability to create algorithms. Now, the data science is still scarce and it's still expensive. But once you have the algorithm, it's ubiquitous and free. It, doesn't, it does not neg negotiate wage increases as you go forward. And finally, when you look at the Internet of Things, which is probably the least deployed yet, but as that gets deployed, as we're seeing with things like Nest in, in, in the home and whatnot, you, you can essentially optimize a physical system for free. So when you realize how impactful these things are, the key message for anybody in any sector of the economy is, sooner or later this wave is going to change the rules of engagement in your sector. It's going to change the design constraints around the solutions. And when that happens, it's really important for you to catch the next wave. Now we've known this for a very long time. And the, the sad fact is, that it's been very, very hard for companies to actually do this. Here's a list of tech technology leaders who have missed their, their, their next wave. There are 54 companies on this list. They go all the way back to the mainframe companies. They come all the way up to the, to the, to the mobile companies, uh, mobile handset companies of the last few years. In every case, these are companies that were business leaders. These were not, these were not the second and third rate companies. These were the winners. And in every case, they failed to catch their next wave. So it just begs the question, why is this so hard? What's making this so hard? And we used to say, you know, well, it's the antibodies, it's the corporate antibodies, it's inertia, it's whatever. We've got to get more precise with, about it if we're going to actually fix this problem. So the fellows at McKinsey have come up, the people at McKinsey have come up with a very useful model that helps us get right at the nub of what's going on here. It's a model that talks about how resources are allocated during the annual planning process across three different horizons of return on investment. So the idea is, if I give you some money in, a, in an annual planning exercise, when do I get it back? Now, horizon one is, 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 is I'll get it back in the current fiscal year. I'll give you more money for headcount, you'll give me more sales at the end of the, uh, end of the year. I'll give you more money for engineering headcount, you'll give me a new product. Horizon two is, well, I give you the money this year, I actually don't get anything back this year, but next year I will, and the following year I really will. And then there's even a horizon three, which is, you know, I'm not sure if we'll ever get the money back. This is three to five years out. It's just an experiment. But if it works, it could be a really game-changing experiment. So those are three different sort of uh, value propositions, if you will. And you say, well, now, how do, where do established enterprises get stuck? Well, they certainly don't get stuck in horizon one. Established enterprises are extremely good at making their number in the current fiscal year. 
And I think for a while we said, well, you know, the problem is they're just not good at innovating. But if you look ahead and you look at their laboratories, that's not true. The Horizon 3 investments that are going on in laboratories, and that did go on in the Nokia labs, in the HP labs, in the Bell labs, in the IBM labs, very, very good stuff. Stuff that came, the, the, the classic one being Xerox Park, where the innovation was fabulous, it just, Xerox itself couldn't take advantage of it. Well, why couldn't they? And the answer is Horizon 2. The Horizon 2 investment threshold is one that works, it's very unnatural for an established enterprise to embrace. So why is that the case? Well, it has to do with this notion of J-curves. So a J-curve says, look, I'm going to give you some money now, and things are going to get a lot worse in terms of financial metrics before they get better. You're going to go into a deep hole, but you're going to come out the other side and, and, and change the world. That, by the way, is the venture trajectory. That's what venture capital is designed to invest in. And it does so by getting a portfolio of investments of which it expects a handful to make it all the way through the J-curve and more than pay back the money invested in the entire portfolio. That works for venture capital. It doesn't work in an established enterprise. The, the public shareholder does not have that, that point of view. And, and so when you, when you have this, this, this uh, horizon to investment, you're putting in an overlay sales force, you're, putting in, you're doing extra work all throughout the supply chain. It's an inefficient sales motion. You're trying to create market rather than consume market. There's lots of reasons for your financial metrics to go down. And the problem is you're being measured quarterly in the public markets, and there, be, there comes a crisis of confidence around that J-curve. And it has to do a lot with the fact that the selling motion itself is just not very productive. People, for the next generation innovations, people don't have budgets set aside yet. You're going to make a compelling case for why they should. And after you make that case, they probably will. But making that case takes time. And if you're trying to make a quarterly cadence of bookings, that's very, very difficult to do. And finally, if you look at who's going to do this, Who's going to take this new innovation to scale? It's the same people you need. It's, it's your very best people. And, and they're the same people you need to keep your existing book of business competitive against a bunch of competitors that are coming after you. So when you look at this problem, we always thought that the reason why established enterprises struggled to catch the next wave was that they weren't innovating. And we thought it was an R&D problem. What this suggests and shows is it's not an R&D problem. It's a go-to-market problem. It's the go-to-market bandwidth that constrains an established enterprise and creates the crisis that, that Clay taught us to call the innovator's dilemma. So when you look at this world, I think the easiest way to sort of grok this is we always used to think of innovation as a funnel. You'd start with a lot of things at the top, you'd winnow them out in the middle, and some good things would come out the bottom. That's true of sustaining innovations. That's how phase, a phase gate or stage gate process can work with sustaining innovations. It weeds out the ones that aren't that useful, the good ones come through. It's not how it works with disruptive innovations. The stage gate method does not work with disruptive innovations because horizon two is not the middle of the funnel, it's the bottleneck in an hour class. And so get, solving for that problem, realizing that horizon two is a deeply unnatural act that requires an organizational response that is not normal is the key to solving for the uh, innovator's dilemma. So how do we, how do we frame this? Well, in, in doing the work with Salesforce and with Microsoft, we began to see that the way to frame this was to understand the, the enterprise is operating in four different zones. And each zone has its own playbook, and each zone has its own mission. So how did the zoning work out? Well, we want to divide up the world from the sustaining innovation work, which of course must continue for the enterprise to be successful, and the disruptive innovation work, which is clearly uh, on, an, on another part of the, uh, of the table. And typically the people that are good at doing sustaining innovations and the people that are good at doing disruptive innovations are not the same people. And so sequestering those two from each other makes a lot of sense. The other half of this two by two says it's important to sequester the current material revenue capability, the generation capability of the company, its cash flow, if you will, from all the enabling investments that that cash flow funds, to, to both to make the present work and to make the future possible. So that creates this notion of four zones. 
And when you, when you dig into the four zones, what we're going to see is that three of the four zones are relatively uh, permanent zones, and they show up in virtually every corporation around. And the fourth zone is going to be a transitory zone, and it's the one that tends to be missing in action, particularly in the 54 companies that didn't catch the next wave. So the first zone is the performance zone. This is the zone where you make what you sell and sell what you make. This is the zone that makes the number. It's the sales force, go-to-market capability, combined with the product ownership capability. And basically, it has Horizon 1 metrics, and we're going to dig into each of these a little bit in just a minute. But that's, that's what it's about. If you have a number in your compensation plan, you're in the performance zone. If you don't, you're probably in the productivity zone. So the productivity zone is all the other functions in the, in the corporation that do the work to make the performance zone successful. It's also a, an Horizon 1 oriented uh, 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 zone. So, so it's, it's, it's legal, it's finance, it's marketing, it's customer service, it's everybody that doesn't have a number but who does all the work behind the scenes to make the people that do have the number be successful. And in a world of no disruption, you would only need two zones. We'd be done. But what happens in a disruptive world is you need to at least touch the new, the new disruptive stuff, stay in touch with it, see where it's going. And so that causes established enterprises virtually uh, unanimously to create an incubation zone. And the, the incubation zone is a Horizon 3 oriented place. It could be a lab, it could be a skunk works, it could be some, some tuck-in acquisitions. It's a bunch of, it's, a, it, it's kept sequestered from the performance zone. You don't expose it to the, to the demands of the performance zone. You don't give it a number. You, you, you're, you're giving these people a chance to fail fast. In the performance zone, failure is not an option. But in the incubation zone, it's actually, it can be a virtue. The idea is either win or learn, but, do it, but, but cycle through it very quickly. So those are the three zones that, that established enterprises pretty much have across the board. And, and, and it's the fourth zone that's the zone that, that uh, does not get implemented. We call that zone the transformation zone. And this is an horizon two zone. And the, the key to this zone is I am going to take a disruptive innovation and I'm going to bring it to material scale at, 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 as part of the revenue and, and, uh, and cash flow of my company. And by material, we mean like 10% or more of the total. And that's the, that's the one when it blinks in and out, that's because this is the zone. First of all, it's a temporary zone. You would only activate it when you were going to, go, to onboard a disruptive innovation. And just to put this in perspective, if your company was successful in assimilating, catching one wave, just one wave per decade, you'd be world class. Most companies fail to catch any wave after their first uh, uh, round of success. So this is the, this is the, the, the zone we're going to spend a bunch of time on at the end. So every, every zone has a different mission. Every zone has a different playbook. So what I'm going to do is just chop talk you very quickly through the four zones, and then we'll get into this notion of how you zone to win. So the first of these zones is the performance zone. So the mission there, deliver material bookings, revenues, and contribution margins in Horizon 1. It's a very, very straightforward mission. And you can organize the playbook around a very straightforward model. It just looks like a, a, a very simple spreadsheet. The, the columns in the, in the table are your go-to-market channels. And the rows in the table are, your, are the offers that you sell through those channels. So basically, the rows in red have, are accountable for revenue, and the columns in green are accountable for bookings, and the bookings and the revenue have to add up to the total in the annual plan. This is not a complex framework at all. Now, just because it's not complex doesn't mean it's not challenging to execute. And some of the things we learned in looking at Salesforce and Microsoft and, and, and other companies in the tech sector around what can go right or wrong with this model, the first one is, Accountability is, is critical to have every row and every column have a unique owner who takes responsibility not just for the total at the end of that column or row, making that number, but is also accountable for making all the intermediate numbers in the cells. In other words, we're going we're to cross-connect the rows and the columns and create what we call cell-level accountability with this model. That turns out to be a challenge in many companies. Many companies have very strong column um, accountability, but the cell level accountability often gets lost. The second thing here is it has to have scale. 
You cannot put a channel into the uh, performance model or a product into the performance model if, it's less than, if it contributes less than 10% of the total plan. And the reason for that is you just cannot ask the performance zone to work at that level of granularity. You've got to give it solid big things to work with. We're gonna, if you're gonna have cell level accountability, that cell has gotta have a meaningful amount of, uh, of, of revenue in it for, for everybody to pay attention to it. So it's very important you not let subscale rows or columns into the model. The rows and the columns have to interlock at the cell level for accountability. And, and this, well, this is against performance metrics. So at every cell, the idea here is that every cell in this matrix, every, every uh, week, every month, and every quarter gets reported out on. How are we doing in that cell? And you can do a red, red, yellow, green chart against it. Many companies, because they don't have, what they often do is let the salespeople sell whatever they can sell. So there's, there's accountability in the green, but it leaves the, re the red row owners out, kind of hung out to dry because they can't hold the channel accountable to their row. That's a, it's a mistake. It creates, it creates ineffective uh, reporting. You, you, you get blindsided late in the quarter and late in the year. You should have seen it much, much earlier. You would have seen it much, much earlier if you were maintaining cell level accountability. So that's the performance zone, and, and, and that's the performance matrix. There's a bunch of stuff about it in the book, but those are some of the highlights of what we covered there. Moving on to the productivity zone. Now remember, the productivity zone is a set of cost centers that's designed to support, to do all the work behind the scenes to make the, the, the performance zone more productive, more, more efficient, uh, and, and regulatory compliant. So it's a lot of different organizations. Marketing, procurement, enterprise IT, supply chain, uh, legal, administration, central engineering, customer support, quality control, human resources, facilities, and finance, and there, there may be more. But, the, but these are not organizations that you can build a large company uh, uh, with without, without staffing these. So these are really, really important to get the work done. If you look at the work we're asking them to do, it's threefold. We're either saying to them, I want you to make productivity programs which make my performance zone more productive. I want you to produce systems which make my performance zone more efficient. Or I want you to uh, maintain regulatory compliance to make sure that we all stay out of jail. And, and those are the three things that, the, that, the, that uh, those are the three key deliverables from the productivity zone. Now, when you look at the productivity zone, step back. The compliance stuff is not negotiable, but it's also not a big part of, of, of the equation. Most of the money in the productivity zone is spent on either programs or systems. And it turns out that we don't make crisp distinctions between what's a program and what's a system. And it, we lose an enormous amount of traction by doing this, and frankly, we waste a lot of money by not doing this. So the program systems distinction, again, this came out of the work with large corporations. We saw opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to do a lot more with a lot less if we maintained a discipline which said, are we doing a program or a system? And the key insight is they're not compatible with each other. So you think, well, really? So why is that the case? Well, if you look at programs, the key idea behind a program is to change the state of something. Now, when we get to systems, we're going to see it's to maintain the state. But a program is to change the state of something. You want to do that with a customized service. It's very user-focused. It tends to be user-funded. And if there's something about the program that isn't working correctly and the user's uncomfortable, you change the program to fit the user. The idea is to change the state of the, uh, of the participant in the program and kind of do whatever it takes to get that done. Contrast that with a system. A system is designed to maintain a state. It's designed to, to keep things running smoothly. So this is, this is, this is not customized. It, it's, it's standard across the entire enterprise. It's not user funded. It's centrally funded. And if there's some a conflict between the user and the system, the user is expected to adapt to the system. Whereas with a program, the program is expected to adapt to the user. So it's a they're very, very different equations. And, and the, key, the key insight here is you want to manage them separately and not blend them. And it's, it's just, it's, it's kind of shocking if, you, if you're, you care about this distinction and you start talking with your colleagues about it, you realize you blend them all the time. And when you blend them the time, you either get a program that's inefficient and, 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 or you get a system that's, that's ineffective and, and it's like, man, that's not what we want. So what you want to do when, you, when you're deploying in any of these uh, productivity zone functions, 
When you're deploying uh, outward facing programs and systems, be very clear about which one you're doing and be very clear about what its capabilities are and what, it, what they aren't. And so we think that what you want to do, since often you're going back and forth between programs and systems, is designed kind of like an API. You know, the systems is sort of like the underlying operating infrastructure that you don't change, and programs are like the applications that go on top of an operating system that you do change. And if you keep that architecture in mind, the productivity of the productivity zone itself can skyrocket. Okay, just go going forward now to, to, to the disruptive side and kind of where, where we're going to spend the rest of this talk. The incubation zone is where we invent the future, okay? It, it, it's delivering viable options for the future, and it's a horizon three play, so no immediate deliverables. So how do you want to organize there? And here, the key lesson is laboratory don't, laboratories don't work. We've tried laboratories for many decades in, in my generation, and the problem is they create great technology, but when you try to transfer the technology into the performance zone, it, it's not mature enough, there's not enough business value, there's not enough proven customer base for the performance zone to absorb it. And so what we've now learned to do is when you're creating initiatives in the incubation zone, create them as independent operating units. Treat them as like they're almost as if they're like startups that are being funded by a venture firm. Each one has a general manager, it has its own sales, its own marketing, its own engineering. You're trying to build a micro business in the incubation zone. You want to integrate, interact with the market and, and get customer feedback and, and, and compete, with, compete with the other startups and, and the other companies in the market going forward. To fund that, you don't want to fund that in the annual planning process. The annual planning process is designed to fund large, ongoing flywheel businesses. It's not designed for this venture-style funding. So what you want to do is create a venture-like board. Now, you're not going to give stock options. You're not trying to create venture returns. You're just trying to manage, steal a page from the, from the venture capital management playbook. But in that playbook, what you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to ask every independent operating unit to pitch the board to get funded. And, 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 and that's what, it's going to feel like Shark Tank. It's going to feel like uh, a place where you're, uh, you know, pitching, pitching to get things happening. And that competitiveness and that entrepreneurial flavor is critical to making the incubation zone work right. If you don't have that, the danger is you become an R&D lab, you become more like an academic world, you frankly become what we sometimes call corporate entertainment, great demos, no, no real traction ever. And then finally, because you live inside an enterprise, you need to, 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 and that enterprise has compliance responsibilities as well as systems and programs, you need to, to, to interface with the existing finance, human resources, administration and whatnot. But because you're a startup-like entity, you're really not designed to interface with those things. So what we've, said, what we've learned is that there needs to be a liaison layer of typically a person from each of those functions who kind of buffers the interaction between the independent operating units in the, in the incubation zone and the rest of the, the ongoing productivity zone processes so that you don't bury the incubation in process but you also don't create lawsuits that, you know, that put the, the, the whole enterprise at, at, at risk. So in this model, the, the key ideas are each independent operating unit run by a dedicated general manager. All functions report into the GM. There's no shared resources with the performance matrix. This is a mistake that large companies make all the time because there's always two or three companies in the performance matrix who are excited about the new thing. And of course, the GM wants to get that exposure. And so they tend to start to rely on the performance zone for, for, for sales uh, and marketing and, 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 and services. And they get it, the, they get two or three of these things, but then it dries up. And when it dries up, the performance zone's got to off to say, well, we got to go make our number this quarter, and, and, and the incubation zone is deserted. It's just a bad, it's a bad structure. So it's very important that we, we give the incubation zone, it's got to look and feel like a, a, an actual startup, so they can actually do business and, and prosecute business on its own. Now, the way you fund it is not by giving it some money every year the way you would fund in the normal uh, uh, performance zone or productivity zone. The annual planning process is not appropriate for the incubation zone. Instead, it's a milestone-based funding process. Again, we're just taking another page out of the venture playbook. So typically, there's a Series A sort of technology proof of concept. You know, can you get, the, or that's a seed maybe, then the Series A is can you do, build a minimum viable product, can you get your first customer? 
maybe in Series B, can you cross the chasm? Can you win a beachhead market? Series C, can you get this thing to a scale where we can imagine with, uh, by moving it into the transformation zone, this thing could actually become 10% or more of, of, the, of the future revenue of the company. So it's, it's a milestone-based thing, not an annual planning process. And as a result, you can, you can have one of these things go forward or get shut down within any quarter of the year. What you do do once a year is set the size of the incubation fund, but you don't actually fund, you don't even discuss the, the, the companies in the incubation zone during the annual planning period. Now, the quick key question here is, when do you, um, how do you, when do you call the ball? How do you get out of the incubation zone? And, and it turns out that there's multiple paths out of the zone, of which the first one is the one that you're hoping for. That's the one that says, you have incubated the next big thing. You're going to take, what, catch one of these waves of disruptive innovation. You're going to ride what used to be scarce and expensive, now is ubiquitous and free. You're going to use that opportunity to create an offering that's never been seen before. You're going to take the world by storm. Create a, you're going to be the iPod. You're going to be the iPad. You're going to be the iPhone. That kind of idea. Okay, That's a great outcome. It's called transitioning to the transformation zone. It doesn't happen very often. Most, it, it, just ask a venture capitalist. It just doesn't happen very often. So now what? If, if, if you're not the chosen one, what, what's left? Well, this next most valuable thing is for you to say, look, okay, we didn't quite get there, but we created something valuable. And if we can bolt it on to one of our existing lines of business in the performance zone, we can give that line of business a midlife kicker. We can give it an, a new lease on life. We can give it another three, four, five years of viable com competitive advantage by just essentially using our technology to amplify and give it sort of its modern next generation look and feel. So that's a, that, it's not a home run, but it's certainly a single or a double. It's a great, great for your batting average. A third positive outcome, not quite as good as the first two, but still at the end of the day, worth very much worth doing is you say, well, we're not really going to commercialize this technology. It's, it's for whatever reason, it's just not, not us. But it's good technology, and we can use it internally to make ourselves more productive. We can make our data centers more effective. We can make our programming more effective, what, whatever it is. And so you can actually send it into the productivity zone and, and take advantage of it there. So those are the three ways you can win. Now, if you say, well, gosh, none of the three. A fourth one is, you know, this is actually pretty cool stuff, it, but it's just either the wrong time for us or the wrong fit for us. We should spin it out. We should spin it out and let it, let it compete for, for venture capital in the outside world. Maybe we'll keep a stake in that and see where that goes. So that's a, that's a fourth outcome, and that's particularly good for the incubation team if they are very passionate about it and, and there's no place for the, uh, for, the, for the new business inside your company. Then uh, the last two ones are, well, okay, it wasn't our finest hour. Let's sell or for salvage whatever we have to sell, or maybe we just shut it down. But the point about this exercise is, with the incubation board in charge, you want to have very disciplined exits, very disciplined funding milestones, so that you don't have this sort of aging portfolio of mediocre innovation that tends to clog up uh, the incubation zone in, in many established enterprises. Now, finally, we get to the transformation zone. Now, this is the zone that really defines the success or, or the failure of, of the disruptive innovation investments in the long term. The idea here is to scale a disruptive, a disruptive option to material revenue, which means greater than 10% of total revenue during a Horizon 2 period, which is typically a two-year period. We say 18 to 36 months to, to do that. So if, to think about how that works. You've got an incubation zone. You've got a bunch of, of candidate independent operating units in Horizon 3 in the incubation zone. You've got a performance zone, which has got a performance matrix. And what you want to do is you want to insert a new row into the performance zone. You're going to create a net new line of business that, 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 that investors will see. So Amazon is a retail company, and all of a sudden there's a net new line of business called Amazon Web Services. It changes the value of the corporation dramatically. Apple was a PC company, then it had a music business, then it had a smartphone business, then it had a tablet business. Okay. Three new rows in the performance matrix change the value of the company dr dramatically going forward. So the key idea behind that is you've got to navigate the bottleneck in the hourglass. So the whole point is what could you do in the transformation zone that would allow your company to break the back of the innovator's dilemma 
which is essentially another way of saying that is get a project through the, 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 the choke point uh, of Horizon 2 in, in the hourglass uh, approach of, of innovation uh, maturity. So when you do this, the key understanding is this is an unnatural act from the point of view that you cannot do business as usual and perform this act successfully at the same time. Because, it, because what happens when you try to trans, when you take one of these disruptive innovations and bring it to scale, you make demands on the rest of the corporation that far exceed the normal bandwidth of what they can, of what they can absorb, their elasticity. You're snapping their elastic is what's happening. So in the performance zone, I want to take this disruptive innovation from, say, 1 or 2% of our total revenue to 10%. Well, I need 10% of the sales force to do that. And in fact, the truth is, because it's an inefficient sales motion, I probably need 15% of the sales force to do that. And I have an overlay sales force, but boy, that's getting expensive. And now all of a sudden, my contribution margins and my book to bill and all my operating expenses, they all look crazy. And so there's enormous pressure on the performance zone to say, can I make my number and do this? The productivity zone's getting the same, the same heat. So now all of a sudden, the productivity zone's got to step up its capability, much more program support to go into the trend, uh, uh, to support the, the innovation in the transformation zone. But also they've got to do a lot of systems efficiency to pull out the resources in order to allocate them uh, to the transformation zone. And then the incubation zone's got to understand, look, We've got one in the hopper in the transformation zone. We sure as heck can't take a second one. So wh wherever you are in your life cycle, you have to now consider one of the other five exits because, because we cannot have two in the, in the hopper at the same time. The key point here, and that is the key point, this, this notion of taking something to scale in the transformation zone, it's a massively disruptive undertaking. The CEO must lead it. He's the only, she or she is the only person that can lead it. You cannot delegate it to anybody else in the company, and you can never do two in parallel. You must only do one. And I have to say that that, that, that notion that the CEO is the only one that can lead and that you cannot do two at the same time, those two are the principles that are most likely to have been violated in the 54 companies that didn't catch the next wave. I want to take you through a couple of uh, uh, case studies. One is, one is Salesforce and one is Microsoft, and give you a feeling of how this has played out. And it's played out very, very differently in the two companies. And the reason for that is that Salesforce is a $5 billion company going to $10 billion. It's actually well past five now. But the point is, it's on an arc from five to 10 to potentially 20. It is, it is actively seeking to add the next row to its performance matrix. Microsoft is a $100 billion company, which isn't actively seeking to add a row. It's all of its rows are under attack. And so what we're going to see is Salesforce is going to play a version of the four zones we call zone offense, and Microsoft's going to play a version we're going to call zone defense. And here's how it plays out. So thinking about zone offense first. So the zone offense idea begins with, we think we found a star in our incubation zone. And what we're going to do is we're going to take it and we're going to bring it into the transformation zone. What that literally means is the general manager of that independent operating unit, which is probably 1% to 2% of total revenue, is going to be made a, a row member in the performance matrix with full, with full support from all the, channels, uh, 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 all the sales channels, even though it is dramatically subscale. Well, you can't ask the performance matrix to do that. That's not, we just said it's not designed to do that. So this is why the CEO has to intervene and say yes, Normally, we would never do this. This is the exception. This is what we're going to do. And this business, making this business go from 1% to 10% of our total revenue, getting it to scale, getting it through the tipping point, is the number one priority of our corporation for every single employee in our corporation. Not just for the team that's doing it, not just for the, for the, for the division or, 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 the, the whole bu or the business unit that hosts it, for everybody in the organization. It is the number one priority. Now, having said that, very close behind is number two priority, which is we would like to make the fiscal, the fiscal plan. But one of the things that will happen in this, during this journey is it's quite likely that the head of the performance zone, particularly the head of sales, will come to the CEO at some point and say, well, I think we're going to miss our number if we're not careful here. I think I need to pull back some of the resources from the transformation zone in order to make our number. You do want me to make our number. And, the, and by the way, what most CEOs have said is yes. We, we will have to figure out how to make that work. That turns out to be the wrong answer. The correct answer is, yes, I do want you to make your number, but 
you may not pull back any resources from the transformation. And the reason for that is, once you've started a transformation zone initiative, you must see it through to completion. When you stop halfway through, all you get is very, very bad outcomes on every, on every, on every front. You, the, the market loses confidence in you, you've spent a lot of money that you get no return from, you're, you've demoralized your performance zone, it's, it's just a bad, bad outcome. So even if you have to miss your number to make it through the transformation, it is more important. And by the way, once you get through the transformation, all is forgiven, but there can be a very, very brutal time when you, if you do miss your numbers, because the public markets are very, very uh, punitive when you do that. But, and you could even put your company in play by having your stock price go down to a point where you, your, your company is now an acquisition target, but you must see the transformation through. In that context, the productivity zone becomes the third priority just for every piece of help it can give to the performance zone so that the performance zone can do its very, very best to make the numbers it, given the constraints of its, its primary support for the transformation. And frankly, the incubation zone is, 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 the, is, a, is, the, is the low man on the totem pole. And so when you look at this model, basically what you're putting together is a world where it's transformation first, performance zone second, productivity zone third, and incubation zone guys, we're gonna, you're going to have to go on a, on, a, on a prolonged diet. So everyone's enlisted in scaling the new business. By the way, from a compensation point of view, what that should mean is every executive in the company should have their primary discretionary compensation depend on whether this business gets to scale or not. Now the good news is stock options and, stock and restricted stock units work very well here because if this thing gets to scale, the market will revalue your company. But it's, what's important is you, what you don't want to allow to happen is to have somebody in the company win locally with their compensation program at the expense of the transformation. You never want to incent that behavior, and most compensation programs unfortunately do. Now, let's go to zone defense. So that was zone offense. That was, that was Salesforce adding you know, the, the force.com to their, to their matrix, adding marketing cloud to their matrix. Now they're looking to add you know, community and internet of things and analytics to their matrix. They've got a very ambitious uh, uh, sort of pipeline of things to go after. And they are proactively looking for the opportunity to insert the next big thing into the transformation zone. Microsoft encountered a, a very different problem. It, Arguably the most successful company ever in high tech. It had three anchor franchises, the Windows operating system, which had ubiquity everywhere at the edge, the office uh, productivity system, which wherever you had Windows you wanted to have office, and the back office things of SQL Server and Business Server and a whole raft of, of back office capabilities, all of which ran on-premise or on-device. Well, what happened in, uh, in, in this century is the mobile device uh, uh, displaced Windows with iOS and Android at the edge. So that now Windows is, is, is a very, relatively small percentage of the total number of edge devices that interact with the cloud and interact with, with, with global computing. So as a result, Microsoft can no longer claim that, that you have to have Windows everywhere. And then that, may, that puts Office at risk, and, and Office is put more at risk by the fact that Google Apps, which competes directly with it, is typically given away for free, or at least certainly at the low end it's given away for free. And, and it has a very collaborative infrastructure, which has been a challenge for Office. And then finally, the, the back office material, which is, was all very profitable, but it was all on premise, the cloud itself uh, disintermediates that. So here you had a situation where Satya inherits a company where all three of the performance zone sort of key engines are under a direct attack from a disruptive innovator. So the problem he has to solve is, I'm under attack in the performance zone. If I just leave the business in the performance zone, if I leave it with its existing metrics and its existing programs and systems, and particularly its existing compensation programs, I will for a while continue to make money, but I will not respond to the life, to the existential threat of these challenges, because you can't do that in the performance zone and make your numbers go, it's just it's not, People don't budget that way, it's not allocated that way, the personnel are not even the right personnel to do that. So what they've done instead is they've said, we're going to take a row in the performance matrix that's under attack, and we're going to bring it into the transformation zone, and we're going to transform it. The first one they did was their back office business. So they, they, took, they took the back office business, and they said, we're going to go from on-premise to the cloud, and we're going to make Azure our number one bet for the back office. And, and, and in doing that, we're going to 
push Azure into, all, into the marketplace and, and, and send our sales force to sell it over and above the back office thing, even though the back office is more lucrative, better margins, easier to make the number, we're saying, yeah, I know, but this is a transformation. So with, with Satya cloud first, mobile first, and actually Balmer supported this when Satya was running the back office, they pushed Azure out and Azure is now successfully re resuscitated and rehabilitated, and then they can put it back into the performance zone. Now, the second one is Office. So Office, again, when, when, Chi, uh, when um, Satya took over, he turned to Chi Lu, who was running, the, he put him in charge of the office, and he said, the key to Office is mobile first, cloud first. And she said, great, I have no product that's mobile and no product that's cloud, but, but we'll make this work. So Office 365 became the engine that pulls the Office franchise forward. Again, not as profitable to sell as Office on devices, but again, it is the strategic place to be. And so put all the emphasis there. And now Office 365 is arguably, I'm not sure if it's completely back in the performance zone or not, but it, it certainly is it has, it's well past the tipping point and that's gonna go back in the performance zone, and then Windows will be next. Now when you do that, when you pull somebody out of the performance zone and bring them into the transformation zone, the next priority is actually to go into your incubation zone and say, do we have anything in the incubation zone right now which can help us accelerate this? Or can we do an acquisition in the incubation zone that will help us accelerate this? Microsoft very quickly got onto mobile with their office, but they did it through acquisitions. Now they're internalizing that acquisition and they're making it, they're making it uh, you know, compliant with all the rest of their infrastructure, but they did it quickly through the incubation zone and you just jam it in to the transformation because speed really, really counts. And then the performance zone is always there. You can never neglect the performance zone. And in this case, the productivity zone ends up being the fourth one being emphasized because the incubation zone, it's so important to, to go into there and say, guys, I know you were thinking about building the next big thing and it wasn't, it wasn't in response to an attack on Office or an attack on, on, on our back office or an attack on Windows, but we need, you, we need to take whatever it is you have that can help us and we're just going to steal it from you. So that, that, that's how that plays out. So again, you're enlisting everyone in the company in stabilizing the current business. And that's a transformational outcome that you need to achieve. And again, two years is, 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 a, is a, about all the time that the public markets will give you before they start to begin to question your, your, your competence. Finally, there are times when it's not this year. In other words, it's not this year that we have an innovation we're going to take to scale, and it's not this year that our, one of our franchise rows in the performance matrix is under attack. So in other words, this is business as usual. By the way, if I said you had to do one of these every 10 years, this might be seven or eight out of every 10 years. So this is the normal situation. In the normal running of a large enterprise, the performance zone always comes first. Everybody else in the company works for the performance zone. The productivity zone comes next in support of the, uh, the performance zone, and the incubation zone comes third, creating options for the future. And there is no transformation zone priority because we're not transforming this year. And that, so you build the company around the other, what we would call the three permanent zones, and that's a very, very healthy thing. And by the way, the incubation zone can feed innovation directly into the performance zone, directly into the productivity zone. We can, we can be a, have a very, very successful year, a very, very successful run of years, essentially harvesting the rewards and building up our reserves. And this is actually, this is what public markets understand. This is what public markets want to see. And if you're not in this state more than half the time, you're, you're going to have investor crisis of confidence because you should be in this state most of the time. The problem that the 54 companies had is they couldn't get out of this state anytime. So the transformation zone, you have to be able to activate it. But the notion that you're supposed to transform all the time is a mistake. So just to recap and close this video, the key idea was the challenge is with cloud, mobile, social, data science, Internet of Things, there's an amazing amount of, of disruptive energy in the world. And it's, it's, it's taking so many things that were scarce and expensive and making them ubiquitous socially free that you must take advantage of that. If you don't, somebody else will. And it, it's just the old solutions just don't, those design rules aren't making any sense anymore. You've got to, you've got to catch the next wave. You can't stand still. The four zones, the key idea behind that is to, is to honor the fact that each zone has a separate mission, a separate governance model, a separate playbook, that no zone should be able to dictate terms to the other three. The exception there is the transformation zone. When the transformation zone is activated, it does get to dictate terms to the other three. 
when it is not activated, the normal pecking order is performance zone is that we all work for the performance zone, productivity zone second, incubation zone third. And in this model, then, when, when, when disruptive innovation is to get onboarded, if you're playing offense, that means you're going to take it voluntarily out of your own incubation zone and work to scale it. If you're playing defense, you're going to try to grab innovation from the incubation zone and bolt it on to an existing product line to essentially repel, if you will, a disruptive invader. So, so the, the offense, you're trying to differentiate and get new customers. Defense, you're trying to neutralize and keep existing customers. But both of them you do in the transformation zone because neither can be done under the rules of engagement of the performance zone. And then, and then seven, seven or eight t years out of every decade, my wish for you is that you have the transformation zone at rest and that you'd be making money and serving customers and doing well. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. Enjoy having a chance to talk to you. Hope you have a chance to read the book.